Thank you very much. So I'm glad to see people in the room because, I mean, the title is quite scary and can definitely be overwhelming. So thank you, Gabriele, for the topic. Um, as uh, Dave show, um, told you in a way, I'm very involved in the science part. So I'm a researcher for a very long time, but I'm a clinician as well. So actually, I think seeing patients in a daily basis helped me really trigger a lot of questions that I'm trying to answer in the lab. And the topic is very uh, important today because we know and we have so many drugs in myeloma, we'll argue because we know more about the myeloma cells itself. Perfect. So what I'm trying to cover in this 40 minutes, and again, since it's a breakout, I will not mind if you raise your hand, you want to ask a question, a clarification of what I'm saying. I'm actually open to that, so feel free to really interrupt me anytime during the talk. I'm trying really to cover two major parts, uh, three major parts. So of course, we'll talk about myeloma biology. Then I'll tell you about the genomic study I was referring to during the um, question Q&A session. And then uh, we have to go back to the immunotherapy because right now it's probably one of the most exciting thing we have in myeloma. You have learned from yesterday, of course, you are very well aware that myeloma is this cancer of these plasma cells. You can see it zoom out on the cells on the center of the slide. Um, these are cells, they are actually, uh, we know they're part of the immune cells. So they normally produce anti monoclonal antibody. And unfortunately, when they become malignant, which means when they start to proliferate without control, they are known to produce this monoclonal antibody that you know we monitor in your blood work. And what this monoclonal antibody does is basically produce this protein that can definitely be measuring, uh, we can see in this um, um, right side of the slide. So we actually produce a lot of the protein that we measure using the SPAP, this, pro this test that we ask you to uh, do every time you come to clinic. And you can clearly see normal in patients without myeloma, there is no peak on this level. Of course, patients with myeloma have a lot of this M spike, this protein, so you can definitely see uh, this profile. But what we know about these cells, that uh, because they produce this monoclonal antibody, this antibody can uh, actually damage the bones. This way you can see some of the um, lytic lesion that we see in the x-ray. We know can cause kidney failure because remember this protein can be filtered through the kidney and if there is a big amount can actually plug the, fil the filter which are our kidney and cause kidney failure. And of course can cause anemia because remember these cells grow in the bone marrow. The bone marrow is like a factory where all the cells in the body are produced. So often, if you have myeloma, the cells producing the red cells are low, so there is not enough space. So you can have anemia or you can have neutropenia and so on. Now, of course, I have to show you this cartoon because we have to go back and see, um, again, myeloma is a disease of the bone marrow. You can see in the center of the slide that cancer cells, the myeloma cells, but the reason why I'm showing you that cartoon because we have to keep in mind that it's not enough to have drug that kill only the myeloma cells. We have to have drug that take in account all the other cells that are around the myeloma cells inside what we call the bone marrow milieu. These cells are, of course, other hematopoietic cells, but they are also non-hematopoietic cells. And one important um, to keep in mind are the bone marrow stromal cells. There is a very close interaction between the cancer cells and all the other cells in the bone marrow milieu that what they do basically through the interaction, the myeloma cells learn how to survive, they grow, they are able to even become causing what we call drug resistance, meaning sometimes uh, because they produce some factors, that some drug they don't work anymore because these cells are really create what they call a very protective environment when they actually just take advantage of the growth factor and support to go. And of course, this is very important because we'll go back to this cartoon many times because now we know how important is interaction and how now we can disrupt this interaction to make this myeloma cells to die instead of surviving. One important concept we learn from the myeloma biology is that myeloma is 
why this why is probably called multiple myeloma because since the diagnosis we have multiple clones and you can see for example a diagnosis a patient they are at least we say four to five different clone clone means a group of cells they are act actually different from each other and why this is important because we know that if we use treatment we have to use multiple drugs because at the end of the day we want to kill all the different clones all different group of cells because you can argue if you leave any of these cells left these are the ones that can grow and they can actually cause what we call relapse so an important concept is this one so imagine this is the bone marrow of a patient with myeloma with different clones and we have only one aid we use only one drug to kill the cancer cells what we can do basically kill some of them but leave a lot of other clones in the bone marrow and these cells actually can take advantage of the space that if some of the clones have left to grow even more and become resistant. And this is why you learn how we need to use multiple drugs at the same time. This is why we use three drugs, now four drugs, because we know if we use only one drug, we may remove one clone, but the other clone are absolutely still the same. Number two, and this was actually one of the questions from the audience, is true, we can reuse some drugs that used before because now we know sometimes the same cells, the same clone, can come back when the disease come back. So we can use something that worked before, especially if the time to the response was significantly high. The other thing is the role of maintenance. Since we know we have always some cells left, even when we tell you you are in remission, why we use maintenance is because we want to keep a control on the any cells left. You have learned probably yesterday the concept of minimal residual disease. Just sometimes we don't have the technology to measure deep enough the cancer cells, but there are always some cells left and being able to maintain the response, will maintain the pressure on this clone with maintenance, maintenance therapy, this is something that is extremely important. We learn from the lab and now we're doing the clinic. So we ask you after transplant often to stay on what we call maintenance therapy. After is lenalidomide, but sometimes can be also bortezomib. Now, and this was actually one of the questions from you guys earlier too, uh, we also know that myeloma are not the same. They are not all the same. Um, there are, um, we ask you of course after a patient is diagnosed, we ask you to also do a test called FISH, meaning we look into the um, number of um, chromosomes the, the cancer cell have, because we know there are two groups of patients. There are some patients they present what we call an hyperdiploid, meaning multiple copy of the chromosome, or there are some patients they have some specific alteration called translocation that I'm going to show you an example here. So normally, um, we have two copies of each chromosome. So we have 22 copy plus the X, Y, if you are a male, or XX if you're a female, but you can see there are only two copies. Unfortunately, sometimes, and this is why a ca in normal cells become a cancer cells, this chromosome can get a, num a higher in number, or sometimes they can actually change this place from one, one piece of a chromosome can go in another side of the chromosome and vice versa. Um, this, for example, is a uh, patient with myeloma that you can see uh, there are, in general, two copies of the chromosome, but I want you, you uh, to point your attention to two factors. So one, this is a patient where a chromosome, a piece of the chromosome 4, you can see in green, came to the chromosome 14, and this is what we call translocation 414. Or we have another patient that has a, a translocation 1416, when again a piece of the chromosome 14 goes to chromosome four, uh, 16 and vice versa. This is what the translocation are. This is why often we ask you to get an X, a sample of your bone marrow to identify if we have any translocation. But why this is important? Because we know that if you have any of these translocation, we may call you to have a disease a bit more aggressive, and we try to be more aggressive in terms of treatment. So um, this is what we know so far in terms of the risk gratification. So there are some patients, they have what we call standard risk, 
the chromosome are not, they don't have multiple copy, they don't have any of this translocation, or you can have a translocation of the 1416 and I showed you earlier, or sometimes one of the chromosomes 17 can be deleted, and this is what we call an iris patient, and so far we know that if you have any of these uh, iris features, what we do, we are a bit more aggressive because we know the disease tend to be a bit more proliferative in a way, a bit more resistant to drugs. Now, um, and I will emphasize a lot this concept, we have to remember, yes, one question over there. So usually the trisomy are a good sign, and we call it good prognosis. So having more than one, two chromosomes are usually a sign of uh, a more um, good uh, disease in a way than high risk. So deletion are usually um, bad prognosis, meaning sometimes, yes. Can you repeat? Oh, so I have to repeat the question. Yes, the question is regarding the uh, trisomy. Um, so trisomy means you have three copy of the chromosome. Um, and what we know so far that uh, trisomy like hyperdiploid are good, good uh, are sign of a good prognosis myeloma, meaning that your disease should behave actually fairly well, meaning in terms of response to therapy. Um, the deletion are when in the two chromosome you lose part of the chromosome can be a bit more aggressive. So we know especially if you lose part of the chromosome 17 where we have a gene, they usually stop the cells to grow, uh, which is P53, that can be a, a bad sign of a more aggressive disease. And the other part you have to remember it is translocation for 14, 14, 16, before the uh, venetoclax time before this drug has been approved, even the 1114 were considering high risk. Now, because we have venetoclax, this patient do very well if we have access to uh, BCL2 inhibitor like uh, venetoclax. Perfect. So um, one, one um, uh, important concept that we are learning is that every cancer, this apply to myeloma as well, is at the end of the day a cancer of the genome. And I'll try to simplify what the concept of genome is. So you can see the reason why these cells become um, malignant is because they grow much faster. And the way they learn to, to grow fast is because they have they change the sequence or the alphabet in a way of particular gene called cancer gene. But what is the genome? Well, I'm sure everybody is wondering what is this genomic study, what is genome speci specifically. So if you think these are, this is one cell, the genome is actually the genetic material uh, they actually made who we are, so different from each other, because there is a different sequence of le letter or alphabet, I would like to call. Um, these letters are all organized in what we call the chromosome. I told you there are 22 plus one, um, uh, XX or XY, and these chromosomes are located inside the, inside the cells in what we call nucleus. Why they are so important? Because they actually dictate what the every cells produce, which protein they produce, and dictate the function of every single cell. Now, we know now very well that there are three billion letter in a way of DNA in each cells, and uh, why this is, and they are so important that we know usually the cells try to protect this material very well with a lot of um, mechanisms we call, try to really make sure that DNA, even when the cells proliferate, stay the same. They don't change the sequence of the letter because any change of the sequence can cause what we call cancer cells because the sequences change, so the protein in change and the cells can become from normal to tumor. What we have learned in 2001, after 13 years of study, the first genome was sequenced, meaning for the first time we knew what was the letter, what was the code of our genome. And this, ex this um, uh, discovery was extremely important because you can understand now if we know what a normal cell's sequence a code is, we can now understand what the code is of the cancer cell is. And this is why in um, uh, 10 years after the first 
genome was sequenced and actually I have to say cost billion and billion of dollars just to sequence one genome the first time, the, the, as a scientist we were very excited because now we can actually go inside the cells and understand what exactly is wrong in every single patient. This is why in Nature, which is one of the most uh, high impact factor journal for scientists, there was this picture in the front, they say the future is bright because now we can go inside the cells and understand exactly in each different tumor what is different in that code in the alphabet I told you. And that why this is important because if we know that specific change, that specific sequence change, we may have a drug specific for that specific drug, uh, patient. Now, the disappointing as a myeloma scientist was the hope now, let's say we know exactly what uh, the the sequence of a normal cell sees. In patients with myeloma, we discovered when the first thousand patients with myeloma were sequenced, again, when we went down to the um, genome of every cell, so we discovered that every patient is different meaning there is no, we don't have the same mutation of alteration of the code in every patient. We discovered that there are at least 30 mutations, meaning 30 different sequences that change in, the, in patient with myeloma. And that was disappointing because we were hoping to find one mutation that caused the cancer cells to become malignant and then uh, go after it, creating a drug that was specific for that mutation. So um, in myeloma, unfortunately, we know every patient is different because every cells present with a different alteration of this code. And if you, we try to see at least what are the more frequent alteration, and we found that most of the patients have what we call NRAS, KRAS mutation, meaning there is a change on this sequence of this gene, but unfortunately there is no a direct way to target this gene. That was a bit disappointing. Another, the most, another frequent one was BRAF, meaning another gene important for proliferation in some patients with myeloma we know is mutated. And there are now some drug called BRAF inhibitor that we can use for patients with this particular mutation. Now, to make the story a bit even more complicated, patients with myeloma, they may have more than one of these mutations. We may have see a mutation of a gene called NRAS and a gene called BRAF. And this is why the concept of multiple drugs used at the same time is important because we will never be able to use only one drug to target the disease where we have multiple changes, again, of the sequence of the uh, DNA. But it's important because now that we know what are the most frequent one, we are trying to work in the lab to find different drugs that can actually go after each single uh, mutation. You see, for example, there that the, if patients with myeloma have a KRAS and RAS mutation, there are drugs called MAC inhibitor that can actually be used to target this mutation. Or if there is a BRAF, um, there is a BRAF inhibitors or if there is FGFR3, another gene, the patient with myeloma have mutated, there is FGFR3 inhibitor. The problem is you see a lot of mutation where you can see no drugs still available because we are still trying to find a way to target the mutation and uh, again, maybe target specifically that tumor. This is why earlier on, I think in the future, we can see more target therapy, so be able to identify in every patient what is the sequence alter in the, cancer in the cancer cell and be able to offer the best therapy based on the genetic profile of the cancer cell. Now, um, going back, what we're trying to do as a community, um, knowing that every tumor is different, knowing that every patient is different, with the genome research, meaning if we tr try to really understand the genome, so inside the cells, what went wrong in every single patient, what we're trying to see is really identify the change that drive the tumor, meaning what is really the the, that alteration in the code that allows cells to become malignant to grow much more. And then, of course, identify targets. When I say target, the sequence can be reversed if we have the right drug. And number three, really select the drug based on genomic of the tumor. 
And uh, you may be aware of not, but in um, Calgary, we have been quite fortunate to have, through the support actually of one of the group of the Myeloma Canada, the Southern Albertan um, Society, we were able to create really a genomic unit focused only on myeloma, where we are able to, where we have access to different instrument. These are all next generation sequencers, so machine that can actually be used to sequence the tumor uh, of myeloma patient. And we have def different, uh, now we have a huge tissue bank where we have more than 1,000 sample. And what is unique about this uh, technology, and I will say of the tissue bank that we have, we can actually follow patient over time and see what actually change throughout their journey and disease as well. But why this is important? Because you can see, oh, I know this is a very complicated cartoon, but the concept is for every patient, very soon we will be able to get the, again, what bone marrow aspirate, when we get your tumor cells, we will be able to dissect, to go inside the cells and see what are the alteration of the, the cells. We understand what are the gene more expressed, what are the pathway they are activated, and why this is important, because we can put all this data together and be able to really understand the biology of every single cancer cell. And um, I want to also emphasize the fact that technology is so um, is, is g g growing so fast, and now we can not only sequence a group of cells, we can also do what we call single cell sequencing. So meaning from a group of cells, we can actually create nano drop of uh, kind of oil that contain every s one cell per, per uh, droplet. And this allow us to sequence only one cell at a time. Um, and the technology, of course, are evolving, but will tell you how important it is really to go deep down and understand what each cell uh, look like in a given patient. And again, the uh, concept is if we do this kind of work, we can actually do what we call precision medicine because we will know in every single patient uh, what they exactly went wrong in that tumor cells and try to see what is the best therapy we can offer at this patient. This is why we call precision medicine. And I want to prove you with one case what we were able to do and why uh, we are so um, excited about the concept of precision medicine. So this is one of my patients, a lady who uh, was diagnosed in 2011 with myeloma, was a stage 2 with an IgG lambda. We all know, we always tell you which kind of myeloma you have. We'll tell you the, the monoclonal protein you produce as well as the stage. Just few information about her. She presented with some... Uh, bone lytic lesion. And then we did, as you, um, as I was referring to, always this study of the fish, which meaning we l try to see if the patient has some specific translocation. But you can see that she didn't have any of what we call high risk features, so was a, what we call standard risk. Just to summarize the story, she received every, as any patient, induction therapy, which is that first line of therapy we give you to reduce the amount of protein in the blood. She got the transplant, but then after a few years, you can see she went from one line of therapy to up to six line of therapy, and this included a lot of clinical trials, including um, the Selinexor that we mentioned earlier. Um, she was really, um, unfortunately, never responding to one of them. We actually even used a second transplant on her as, as we um, mentioned earlier, second transplant is still an option when the disease comes back, but unfortunately, even the second transplant was not giving her a control of the disease. So what we have done, we, are, we collected bone marrow when the disease was really refractory to seven line of therapy, and we discovered something very, um, uh, very important. So I know this cartoon is confusing, but um, we discovered that when we analyze, again, taking the tumor cells of the patient, analyze the sequence, that she has some part of the, the genome we're going from one side to another. So you can see here the, trans which the chromosome 14 and chromosome 11. So you can see some of the gene or some of the segment of the chromosome was going from 
this area to this other area and vice versa. This is the chromosome 11. And as a result of these changes of really one piece of the chromosome to another, she had a um, high expression of what we call cyclin D1. Cyclin D1 is a gene very important from proliferation. So her cancer cells were growing without control because she had a lot of cyclin D1 gene express. On the other end, she has also expression of the IGH, which is actually the immunoglobulin that ac get um, uh, activated, get produced in high level when patients become, when, when normal cells become malignant. And actually what we did was um, confirming this finding looking at single cell level as well. I know it looks like a nice cartoon, but what it is is basically looking at every single cell of the cancer cells on myeloma, this specific patient, and we noticed that she had an IGL, so you can see on the IGL, C2 means she expressed a lot of immunoglobulin. She had high expression of cyclin D1, the gene I was telling you, that was driving the tumor. And more importantly, she had BCL2 overexpression. So you may remember from the, uh, Dr. Hay uh, talk earlier that we have now a drug called venetoclax that can actually block BCL2. And with what we did, we basically confirm in the bone marrow biopsy the presence of this um, uh, BCL2. So you can see this is the bone marrow of this patient. These are all the CD138 that we use as a marker to tell these are myeloma cells. And then we, you can see that all the cells express also BCL2. And in fact, with this finding, what we did, we used, we, we actually get, we're able to get venetoclax for the patient. You can see on the graph, these are monoclonal protein when she was going after one trial after the other. When we discovered that this finding, she start venetoclax, and you can see how quickly the protein came down. And I can tell you that this, pro this patient is now in very good response with disease under control for more than two years. Just telling you how important it is to get deep enough to the inside the cells, inside the genome to discover this because it can actually have a lot of clinical implication. And this is why we all very uh, strong believers that we should do what we call this um, precision approach when every patient will do different omics, meaning we look at the genomics, we look at the transcriptomics. So we again, we look inside the cells to really identify what is specifically went wrong in that spe specific patient, then deliver the right therapy for each one, which is, again, something we are um, trying to, right now is based on, is research based, but as uh, you heard earlier from David, I'm trying to lead this, uh, the creation of Precision Oncology Hub, where this kind of approach can be used for every single patient. And this is where I really believe in few years, we are going to see, every time we see you in the clinic, we don't only look at your blood, work where we look at the genetic makeup of your cancer cells because from there we can actually find a specific signature, a specific biomarker, and we, we offer you the best therapy for your specific cancer cell. Now, the last 10 minutes, I want to just touch base um, on the concept of cancer immunotherapy. Um, you probably heard from us how excited we are about this, and I want to just um, uh, mention a few concepts in this regard. We really believe this is the next generation of cancer treatment, um, and you can see he highlighted some of the monoclonal antibodies, some of the CAR T cells, and the vaccine. But first of all, uh, just a reminder why the immune cells are so important. You know, normally, the immune cells are the army in a way that defend us from infection as well as from cancer cells. So uh, our cells, our immune cells, should protect us from infection as well as cancer. So they are different uh, kind of species, so different armies that we have available normally to uh, fight infection as well as the development of cancer cells. They are basically two different group of immune cells. We have what we call natural immunity, something that defend ourselves without, you know, immediately from 
let's think a virus infection. This is mainly played by cells called NK cells, macrophages. And then we have another level of um, uh, fight in a way that is um, called adaptive, really depends on which kind of a, uh, what is the cause of the infection. So it's very specific for the infection there. And also as what we know, uh, a uh, last memory. So usually the T cells, they are engaged in this kind of defense. They also remember what was the infection you fight before. Now, what we know about myeloma is these cells are so smart to hide from the immune cells recognition through different mechanisms. So first of all, they look very similar to a normal plasma cell. So the immune cells, they cannot really tell this is a cancer cell because you can see under the microscope normal plasma cells, the one produce antibody, they look very similar to the cancer cell. And then they also produce a lot of what we call cytokine or growth factor inside there. Remember the bone marrow niche I mentioned to you earlier? So there are a lot of factors there that instead of activating the immune cells, they actually stop the immune cells to be recognizing the cancer cells. In a way, they are telling us, actually, I'm a normal cell, not a cancer cell. So the immune cells are actually unable to recognize the cancer cells. Number three, they produce on the membrane of the cells, what we call checkpoint inhibitor. So in a way, some additional marker that instead of uh, pushing the, um, uh, the gas in a way on the immune cells, push actually the break on the immune cells. So telling the immune cells, I'm actually in normal cells, don't kill me, don't recognize me. And because now we know all this, how really the immune cells, the myeloma cells hide from the immune cells, then now we have different strategy to unlock this immunoparalysis, if you want to call it. So we have a different way to tell the immune cells actually, no, please, go after the tumor because these are tumor cells. And this is a review that I wrote a few years ago, but it still stands because we know now so much about this mechanism that we have different drugs available. And I'm not going to show you all of them, but I want to point out a few things. So first of all, there are drugs that we use in clinic they're called immunomodulatory drugs. I'm sure in, in this audience, most of you have been exposed or you are on drug called lenalidomide, talidomide, pomalidomide. What we know about this drug, they are very effective, but why they're so effective? If you look at the way they work, they actually have two major mechanisms of action. They have, in a way, a direct way to kill the cancer cells that we call anti-tumor effect. But more importantly, they are immunomodulatory because they are able to activate the cells I told you before. They are the army against the cancer, T cells, NK cells. Now we know they are activated when you are exposed to this drug. And this is why we have now the, this drug are part of several regimen. I'm sure you are all in a kind of combination where one of these drugs is combined because we know we have, again, an anti-tumor effect plus an immunomodulatory effect. What about the monoclonal antibody? I'm not going to repeat what um, Annette told you earlier, but these are drugs that go after a specific protein or molecule, you will say, that is just present on the cancer cell. So it's very specific and in a way very different than classic chemotherapy that we were going after all kind of cells growing, this kind of monoclonal antibody, they go after a specific drug called, for example, in this case, CD38, if it's daratumumab. So in a way, it selectively go after the tumor and then be able to really have an anti-tumor effect. I'm going to skip on this because I want to mention one more thing here. So um, again, daratumumab is one of the monoclonal antibody we are very excited about. What about the CAR T cells? I told you already what I think about that, but I want to just mention a few things, additional points. So first of all, we know these are what we call, we basically a, an infusion of autologous T cells, meaning we go, we collect your T cells, we send them in a lab to make them more um, proliferative in a way, or be able to recognize the tumor. And then you can see through the slide that they, they, these cells are then reinfused in patient. 
the CAR T cell therapy you have seen right now, they're going after a marker called BCMA that we know is important because it's expressed specifically on the cancer cells, but you can see that there are different trials. It's just one summary slide of the different CAR T uh, available against BCMA. But you have to think how, um, I wanna point out two things first. So, so first of all, the fact that this therapy is used in patients at seven, 10 line of therapy, so really late. And this is why the point is sometimes if you have an immunotherapy, we should probably use it early on. But in this setting, we were excited because we saw some patients responding to the therapy. There are in the BB2121, which is what the trial open in Toronto, that we are about to start opening in Calgary, there are 100% response rate, meaning all patients respond. But what is the problem there? The problem is they don't last, meaning the disease unfortunately come back. This is why the excitement is definitely there, but with some cautious, because we need to understand why the disease come back. There are, of course, other ways to target the same uh, drugs and the same target, BCMA. There are, you heard about the GSK antibody, this antibody, they go after the same target, but with an additional um, uh, toxin, they get released inside the cells when they get recognized. And again, these are under further investigation. There are the bites that probably, personally, I think are really um, the way we should treat. Um, we should probably, see, we will see a lot of response because the bites, as um, Annette told you, they are, they are able to, in one way, go after the tumor, the express BCMA, but also activate the T cells. Again, remember, these are the army that you want to be able to recognize the tumor and kill it. And there are, uh, there are some clinical trials going. We have one open in Calgary as well, where again, the continued infusion of these bites going ABCMA seems to be very effective in patients when the disease come back. Lastly, um, there are new drugs available. This cartoon is just very busy, I understand, but just bring you back to my initial point. We know now where the cancer cell grow, we know all the cells that surround the, cell, the cancer cells, and now we have different way to target them. So the immunotherapy is an option, great option, but we have additional one. And in fact, there are at least, I mentioned here Selinexor, this inhibitor of XPO1 that we have um, tested, seems to be very effective in patients. We, you heard about BCL2, this BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax, that in combination with Valkydex seems to be extremely effective. So just a summary slide of how additional drugs are coming on the pipeline, they are important. And then I will definitely uh, close and say, because now we know much more about the biology of myeloma, much more about what we causing myeloma, we have now, we are doing better. We have better response. We have, I'm glad to see patients with a lot of stars means how long you went through your journey because there are different options. And I really believe the immunotherapy is the way, is going to change the way we are treating patients because we are seeing deep response, durable. And of course, the genomic technology, I may be biased saying that, but I'll show, I'll show you one example how genomics can guide us to therapy selection to decide which therapy need to be used. And finally, it's probably the first time I write that last sentence, so cure is coming, because we really have now a better understanding about the biology of the disease, and now we have a better also drug available for you. So I'll stop here, I'm very happy to take additional question. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we do have time for two or three questions. Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Um, it's fascinating uh, how much information is available about the genetics now. And uh, I'm wondering if you've come to understand whether uh, these genetic mutations are as are as a result of environmental exposure or hereditary um, uh, genetic mutations, and if there and which ones might have a hereditary component, and whether we should consider um, proactively uh, testing our children, and then if if there is a heredity 
whether it's environmental or hereditary, what kind of prevention is available, and whether uh, people are considering uh, genetic engineering, like how to, to turn those mutations off, or I don't know the right language, but thank They're you. all excellent questions. Some are still um, unanswered. We know myeloma is different than, for example, breast cancer. When you really have that hereditary component, we know like gene BRC1, for example, mutated that you kind of you can predispose your children to. Myeloma has been shown t there is a small component, like a three percent of this alteration I show you earlier uh, are uh, hereditary, uh, meaning they come from you know from your parents. Most of them are acquired. And when I mean acquired means they come because exposure to environmental factors. Um, what we are seeing, and this is still a lot of, there is still a lot of research ongoing, and we are seeing a young patient, um, which before we thought myeloma was a disease of the elderly. But this is wrong because now we have specific group, and I can tell you in Alberta there is, uh, um, we have a lot of young patients, they are involved in oil business because I think the oil uh, farmers, these are unfortunately risk factor of uh, any kind of black cancer, including myeloma. But to answer your question, there is still, we know some correlation, uh, but there is no really a unique uh, mutation that you acquire, you actually are born with, and you can uh, really um, transmit to your kids. But what we do uh, suggest, if the, since there is this 3%, and if you have really multiple members of the family with myeloma, MGAS, that can be a good indicator to start maybe uh, screening them with a mono, with like a serum protein electrophoresis. But it is not like a breast cancer where you have a clear correlation there. So uh, there is no need to panic and think that you are going to expose your children to the same risk because it seems to be more acquired than really um, genetic um, base. Yes. Was there a question there? Yes. yes, we're here. Okay, yes. I just want to confirm this from the, the session we had earlier this morning that what can we do to help boost our immunity system? Um, I mean, other than, other than uh, getting lots of sleep and uh, eating healthy, whatever that means, um, and vitamin D, what else? There must be other things that can affect. No, 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 really. And also the concept of immune um, is, you know, what the definition of immunodeficit is. is very personal. So we have patients that maybe have a neutrophil count of one. They never get infection because the small number of uh, um, neutrophils, which are again part of the immune cells, are good enough to fight the infection. But there is nothing that can be done, um, you know, in terms of lifestyle, food, or even more adding other drugs to it. So we are very conservative because there are no clinical study done to support the use of one agent more than others. So uh, is it really, um, I got the same question earlier during the break. So there is nothing really can be done in advance. We just say health, eat healthy meanings. Don't be uh, afraid even to eat the uh, meat because I heard also the story, oh no, I don't wanna eat the meat because that can induce more cancer. It's not really true. You need the iron that the red meat give you. So if you have a very, um, diverse and you eat uh, vegetables and s meat as well, so you are in good, in small quantity, um, is definitely is enough, but there is nothing else can be done. Um, and again, will be just a, um, a, for each of us, learning from um, your own experience throughout the different drug that you will be going uh, through your journey with myeloma, that we will give you advice, but there is nothing can be done uh, before of that. Okay, we're going to have to wrap up shortly. Uh, I've got a couple of interesting uh, questions from the floor. Uh, okay, well, and that's, that's, that's a question. Um, our break is not very long. Uh, I, I would suggest uh, if somebody needs to take a break, feel free to go ahead and take the break. If you'd like to stay here and, and uh, have yes. questions, uh, I think that's an option. But we do have to meet back here at 11:15 uh, for the next presentation. So your choice, folks. Uh, yes, next question, please. 
I'm, I'm wondering, uh, as far as the genetic testing, so if we're on a treatment line that's working right now, should we um, do the genetic testing? And how do we ask our doctor, and is there a cost? And also, if I've got, I didn't realize till to this weekend that you can have different clones of myeloma. So does genetic testing give you multiple answers of all the clones that are happening? Yeah, so, um, so first of all, if you are on a treatment that is working, nobody including a very highly research-based treat um, center will ask you to change what you're doing. But when the disease come back, we, also s we always suggest to repeat the bone marrow aspirate because we wanna check if this disease change, meaning like in the patient I present, this was a patient never had the 414 translocation, but when she came back, when the disease come back, she developed the translocation. So we suggest our colleagues to repeat the bone marrow aspirate when disease come back, check for this translocation, in terms of um, um, the additional layer of information, unfortunately, still research-based. So patient, I mean, in Calgary, we are lucky enough to be able to offer to patients locally um, this test for no charge. But in terms of charge, the cost is still around $15,000 uh, per test. So this is why it's still not um, prime to be routinely used for everybody. But um, we are, as part of Myeloma MCRN, we are all connected. So if you have this question and your physician think that tests can give you helpful information, we will be happy to even perform in our center. Uh, but we are moving really, we are trying to make really this test available for everybody and having even healthcare, or health, um, health Canada proving that in a way that you don't have to pay yourself for that. I know for, for example, Solid Tumor Foundation One is the company in the States offer this kind of genomic testing, but the cost is uh, crazy. I mean, they charge $2,500 for a test that can be done for less than a thousand, uh, and um, uh, the information are not that deep in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what, what you can learn from it. But going back to your question, uh, let your physician know that you're interested in this test. Let them even approach us directly because we are all connected. We are all part of the MCRN. So we will be able to confirm what kind of uh, tests we can offer, what is the time frame. And we can definitely find even some uh, research funding uh, for that because we are also in the learning uh, part of it. There was another question there, Dave. Yeah. Hello? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is the normal immune system, does it behave differently from person to person? And secondly, um, the number of mutations in, uh, in a myeloma cell or a cancer cell, uh, is that an infinite number? And if so, <laughs> would you be targeting th therapy and treatment for each individual mutation? That, that seems <laughs> like an impossible task. So I'm glad, so you follow all my talk, I'm so glad. So, and thank you for using the word mutation because it's really hard even to conceptualize, right? So um, I think the way we're, so first of all, what we're learning that one drug only will never be enough for patient with myeloma. For the multiple clone we mentioned, because we have multiple, tar multiple mutation at the same time. So you will see in the future, us using drug that they are like proteasome inhibitor, like Valkyrie with an image plus the target therapy. So the target therapy is always add to, to other drugs, to other combination, because we believe, as you just mentioned, since there are multiple, and since sometimes we use the word subclonal, meaning they're present in a small number of cells, if we just go after them, 
the rest of the tumor can still grow. So we, have to, we are envisioning the fact that having the genomic component will help us to understand which kind of target therapy we need to use. But keep in mind, we will still be using drugs that have a multiple mechanism of action, like the imids, all the land, palm, they, because they have that component, a monoclonal antibody, plus the target therapy, because it will be specific for that specific mutation. But in myeloma, we'll never envision be able to use one drug only as like in some kind of leukemia, like with the Gleevex and so on. I have a question here from the floor. Please. Are chromosome translocations and deletions only in the bone marrow, or are they also expressed in the blood too? So they are in the bone marrow, although we are learning now we have a way to detect in what we call cell-free DNA, sometimes from a peripheral blood, if the amount of tumor we know in the bone marrow is big, we will be able to measure this alteration in the peripheral blood too. Uh, but I want you to remember, and this is why always important, actually it's a key question, that the information we still get from the bone marrow aspirate is much deeper, and much more precise than what you get get from a peripheral blood. Uh, so unfortunately, myeloma, because myeloma grow in the bone marrow, all the information, the key information, are from the bone marrow aspirate. We will love one day tell you, you don't need to get the bone marrow aspirate. We know it's invasive, it's painful, but the information are there. And because myeloma grow in the bone marrow, this is where we need to get all the answer. Dr. Neri, are you going to be around for a while longer today? Absolutely. So nope. feel free to approach me, sure, after okay. the break. I think we're going to have to uh, allow everybody else to come into the room. Uh, so uh, I was, unfortunately, had to excuse myself for part of, of Dr. Neri's presentation. How was it? 